Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and welcome to Read Smart, the official podcast of the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. My name is Toby Mundy and I'm the director of the prize and I'm delighted to welcome you to one of a series of programmes that we do every year with the authors of the shortlisted books. Our guest today is Anna Kay, author of The Restless Republic, Britain Without a Crown. It's a panoramic narrative of British and Irish life in the 1650s, the only decade in history in which England was governed as a republic. In the decade that followed uh, the execution of Charles I outside Banqueting House in Whitehall in January 1649. Welcome, Anna, and congratulations on being shortlisted for the prize. Thank you very much. (laughs) You're very welcome. So the sort of famous left-wing historians like Christopher Hill saw this as a time of sort of radical proto-socialism, the diggers and the levellers and the ranters. Others saw the roundheads as the sort of English Taliban who banned Christmas. I think you see this more as a sort of military coup, don't you? Is that fair and right? Well, I suppose, I mean, it, it depends what the what the this is. I mean, I, I see the execution of Charles I as being the consequences of a military coup. Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I think it was. I think there's much debate about that. It's pretty clear. Um, but what followed um, was the consequence of, well, I think of lots of different things. Yes, absolutely, of a powerful um, and very kind of, politicised army, but also of just the kind of tangled of challenges uh, in a country where war had been painfully and bruisingly being fought across the nation for nearly a decade, and um, w- and the consequences of l- people being unhappy about something, but not necessarily having come to a clear view of what a better alternative looked like. So, I mean, I think there is a military coup absolutely at the heart of this decade, but it's not, I think it's so much more than that. Of course, of course, and hopefully um, we'll unpack that as as we go along. I think I I think you said some you said somewhere that it's the role of religion in the English Revolution that makes it different to the ones that followed in France and and America. Can you uh, elaborate on that a bit for us? Yes, I I think one of the things about um, going back to try and understand about things in well in, in this case in the seventeenth century and. Um, the, the, the period I'm looking at, but I think it applies really to everything and before the 18th century probably, uh, is that religion is just such a big component in it. And it's it's hard for us now because we are much, so much a secular society or so much more a secular society than anybody was then that um, it's it requires a kind of real sort of shift of frame of reference to wrap your head around that. And I think when it comes to revolutions, we are you know, we think a lot about the ones that have happened more recently, the Russian Revolution or even the French Revolution, and think of kind of predominantly kind of social revolutions about the dispossessed, you know, asserting themselves and and seeking a kind of more equitable sort of arrangement of society. And I just think that, that when you think about the, the revolution that happened in the British Isles in the 17th century, it was only very marginally about that, or at least that was a much, much smaller ingredient than religion was um, so you kind of got to you got to unlearn the stuff that you know about revolutions later in order to approach this as people did in the 17th century and I guess that's what I really wanted to try and do and try and understand what it was like for people at the time and what terms they saw the world in and therefore to make sense of this, this kind of extraordinary you know, political turmoil of the of, of the age you know against that backdrop. I found myself thinking as I was reading your book of this idea that contemporary political scientists use of the Overton window, this idea that at certain moments the range of policies that are politically acceptable to the mainstream population can shift. It's the sort of the, the, the politics is the art of the possible, and somehow in quite a short time the Overton window shifted very very dramatically, didn't it? Give us a sort of sense of the, the preconditions for that shift. How did it come to be that the, a king could be executed? on the steps of Banqueting House. <laughs> well, how long have you got? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I suppose in a way that was sort of part of my starting point was, um, you, you know, we sit here in 2022 and we think about the world that we know, we 
the death of the Queen, you know, very recently, and everybody lining the routes and waving their flags and so on. And you think about how just how radical it was in 1649. I mean, it'd be unbelievably radical today. And then you go back the centuries and, you know, to a more traditional, more conservative world in every sense, and they did it. So I think you're right to say that that's, you know, just just kind of trying to understand that on its own is a very important thing because it's 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 so astonishing and um, and you know my book tries to explain some of the factors that led to that and a lot of it is about war you know you can't that england and actually britain had been fighting a war since the beginning of the 1640s between different as it were two different kind of broadly groupings of people not about whether there should be a republic or not, that wasn't even on the table, but really about what sort of form of religion um, should apply, whether you know, essentially a very kind of hardcore reformed Protestantism, so Calvinist way of doing things, or a much more traditional sort of kind of apparently Catholic high church form of things. And a bit about what sort of form of um, uh, sort of how, how great the extent of monarchy should be um, in the form of child's first authority. And I think a lot of the reason of the, for, for the unthinkable things being thought is to do with um, how much people at the time saw stuff going wrong in the kingdom as, as expression of God's will. And as soon as you felt that God was fundamentally unhappy with things as they were, that immediately gave you permission to propose things that were on the face of it very radical, because if it was his will, then, you know, it wasn't so radical. So if, as it were, the things that were going on in Britain at the moment, sort of out of control, rather kind of frightening things in the economy and in the landscape and in our political world were happening in the 17th century, they wouldn't be talking about the markets or anything. They'd be talking about God. This is God telling us. That he's unhappy and in, in England in the 17th century plague you know conflict um, uh, and a whole series of other things that people were frightened by were seen as God expressing his discontent and that meant that made them feel we have to do something really dramatic about this to placate him. And in order to tell your story and one of the things you're brilliant at doing is conveying what the book is in one sense an investigation of what it was like to be alive in this extraordinary decade yeah you make some very interesting bold and innovative decisions about the structure of the book the shape of it and that which I found exhilarating and, and ingenious um tell us a bit more about how you your decision to structure the book in the way that you how have you structured the book and and what lay behind the decision to structure it in that way so as you say um the book is to an extent of you know, an account of what happened in Britain between 1649 and 1660 during our Republican decade. But it also, I really wanted it to be a book about what was it like to live through this? Because it, I was really interested in the idea that, you know, people have still got to get up in the morning and, you know, make some breakfast and, you know, um, plow their fields and you know, sell their corn and all the normal things that have to happen against the backdrop of this unbelievably kind of seismic political change. And I was really interested in the extent to which that massive political change did or didn't change what it was like just to be alive in Lancashire or London or Lincoln or wherever it might be in this decade. So I was thinking about how do I convey that story? And I thought that what would really help me to make sense of it, and I thought would really help and be interesting for a reader, would be to take a series of individuals who lived through those years and about whom sufficient amount of primary material survives that you can really kind of get close to what their experience was and to tell the story of that decade not quite through their eyes because I'm not sure you can ever see through anyone else's eyes but as it were standing at their shoulder so that you would gain an understanding um, of the different sorts of experience through the decade from people of different social standing some right at the thick of things politically some absolutely miles away at the periphery uh, but also of different kind of, as it were, political persuasions. Because I really wanted to get away from this idea that, you know, who are the goodies and who are the baddies? You know, are you a roundhead or a cavalier? Because it's just such a sort of pointless way of trying to look at history, I think. You know, your job is to try and understand it, not to sort of make a kind of moral judgment about it. So I went about gathering my people, my protagonists, um, and I wanted to have men and women. I wanted to have as I said, people of different social standing. I wanted to have people geographically in different places, you know, because so often history is told from this kind of this sort of metropolitan, you know, what was happening in Parliament type point of view without any kind of real feel for well, what, you know, what's it like if you're nowhere near that. 
Um, and then I, <clears throat> I did a sort of <laughs> the kind of funny kind of map of my own, trying to kind of work out how could I make it work so that you could get this, also get a kind of beginning, middle and end story. It wasn't just a sort of impressionistic collage, but actually there would be a real proper narrative thread that would run through from, you know, what happened at the beginning to what happened at the end. And so that's how I did it. So I started with John Bradshaw, who tried The King. You know, how would somebody find themselves sitting in that chair in Westminster Hall, looking down at the sovereign, you know, God's anointed sovereign, and passing down judgment on him and to really understand his life, his experience, how he came to be there. And then I have got a series of other people who, who, t- who take us through the decade. And your portrait of Bradshaw is fascinating. He's, he's your first exemplary character, isn't he? And yes. he's, a, he's a Cheshire man who... Um, who saw the plague sweep through his town, if I remember. And that, that coloured his, his view of the world somewhat, didn't it? If if you believe everything is God's will. Well, exactly. Because the other thing is, you know, I think when you're writing about about history and you don't do it, you can't assume that any of us have a real handle on how people thought at the time. You need to sort of, as I was saying, get into that. And I thought Bradshaw was a really interesting case in point of how if you had been the mayor of a town responsible for the well-being of the citizens of that town as he was in the 1630s and that town was absolutely decimated by the plague for nearly two years and you were responsible um, at a time when you know bodies were being buried hand over fist you know the, the all whole economic life of the town had come to a grinding standstill you know, all the animals and livestock were killed. You know, it was really, really devastational. Babies, you know, winding cloths being paid for to wrap the, the corpses of children to bury them. How would that, you know, what sort of toll would that take on you? And if you saw that plague as an expression of God's fury with the nation, how it would require, it would require something of that sort of magnitude to lead you to be sitting in that chair opposite Charles I. But as soon as you see it in those terms, it seemed to me, you could begin to see how you could be sitting in that chair, you know. And um, so, and I, to, to my mind, understanding an individual is, is a much easier way of, of kind of empathising with and kind of transporting yourself just to, for a moment to the past than, than a great sort of sea of generalities about this is what people thought and felt. Um, so, yeah, so I, so I think he's a very interesting figure specifically, but I also think he's a very useful, formative kind of typifier of just the kind of world view of a lot of people at the time. It's a brilliant and balanced p- portrait of Bradshaw, um, tremendously sympathetic about where the personal and the political meet, I, I, I thought. There's also a wonderful short sort of pen portrait of um, poor old Gerard Wynne Stanley, who I felt terribly sorry <laughs> for at the end. Um who uh, was was wanted to wanted to create an agrarian society in um, Surrey, I think, didn't he? How did the ideas of radicals like the diggers percolate in that time? Why why was it not a local phenomenon? How did he achieve a sort of wider notoriety and fame? Well, it's such a good question because actually this is one of the things that's so interesting about this decade, and it has such echoes, you know, today even, which is a, a, a whole novel ingredient of the kind of you know the, the the circumstances of the time was the rise of newspapers so you know a generation before you know that wasn't newspapers were not even a phenomenon in in britain as they weren't really in europe at all and during the 16 the late 1630s and through the 1640s they they kind of came into being and they took off like a wildfire partly because censorship was sort of um, seized up during the Civil War, partly because, um, you know, the kind of events of the time were of of such sort of import that people, you know, the market suddenly was burgeoning for for buying this stuff. And so for somebody like Gerald Wynne Stanley, who, as you say, was a, you know, I find deeply sort of sympathetic, quite sort of trouble, but also a very um, inspiring figure. He was a sort of failed businessman who was in who'd moved to Surrey in in in, in sort of um, after a breakdown really uh, and and he he had this sort of vision of how if everybody just shared everything worked together and worked the common land you know there would be enough for everybody and ownership and property was the kind of construct that was you know, preventing um, preventing the sort of plenty that might might come um, you know he's he is a 
he's a fascinating figure but as you say that could all have been an utterly kind of sort of thing that you'd only get in as it were the sort of church wardens accounts for the parish and never have any other purchase on on on, on the nation except that it was being reported in these new newspapers and he was himself uh, committing his kind of ideas about the world to print and those were being bought and sold you know an unbelievable rate i mean the the rate at which book production print production um, escalated during the 1640s and 50s is just, you know, eye-watering, you know, so that you know, the numbers of publications each year at, at that time are in the thousands, bearing in mind that, you know, 50 years before they hadn't even been in the hundreds. So, um, yeah, that's another thing which is so fascinating, I think, about this decade. Anna, how how great was literacy at this time? If these newspapers and books was, were being hugely widely circulated, that sort of presumes a wide readership for them, I guess. Yeah, it does. And, you know, um, there, there isn't a sort of helpful census return to give us a completely kind of crisp answer to that. Huh. But, um, you know, literacy was definitely on the rise um, and it varied between different parts of the country. So, um uh, the cities we have much the towns had higher levels of literacy than in the countryside people who were in trade that involved um you know um bookkeeping and you know written communication you know mercers and so on were more literate than those who were agricultural laborers um so we're looking at a kind of at a range um i mean in the cities it's you know you're probably looking at male literacy being north of 50 percent female less um in the countryside you know quite a lot less but it is it is clearly the case that in this period, um, not least to say, because we can see it in newspaper consumption, these were cheap, cheap publications produced every week, sold from baskets by women wandering around the, the ends of court and the, um, uh, the sort of streets of Westminster selling them and then carried through the country, that, that, that this is a mass market publication. So this is not just about you know, um, a few sort of, you know, very um, highly educated professional people consuming this stuff. And in fact, the newspapers themselves talk about their own readership. So, you know, um, one of the great newspaper men of the age, who's one of my protagonists, Marchmont Needham, talks about his paper being read by ploughmen up and down the land. Now, he's probably exaggerating, but I'm not sure he's exaggerating that much. And, um, you know, that, of course, is a transforming thing. The fact that suddenly you have... You know, huge numbers who really had never considered anything much outside, you know, their own parish, probably, and certainly their own county, not just reading about what's happening in, in, in London, but reading about what's happening in Paris and Barbados and, hmm. you know, um, Turkey and you know, all around the world. So, uh, you know, we talk about new media now as a when, when we mean kind of the Internet and things connected to it. But of course, this was a new medium with every bit as much a kind of dramatic uh, uh, impact on society um, in the 17th century. So can we say that the sort of this is the moment that the idea of the public emerged and the reading public or the public at large? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you can. And it's certainly, you know, the political public. Um, I think it's, you know, it, 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 you know, the Civil War touched people's lives all over Britain for all sorts of different reasons. Um, it gave you a reason to want to know what was going on. And then the newspapers and popular print was the kind of organ for, for understanding that. And of course, there was a lot of, you know, even if you didn't read, somebody else in your locality would, and they would you know, read you things from, from those print publications. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you see it through the 17th century, the, the rise of participation in the electoral politics generally. You know, by the time you get into the 1680s, there's you know, there are political parties, there's political campaigning. You know, so it's yeah, I think I think it's an absolutely critical moment in the kind of yeah, the sort of awakening of, of national political consciousness. And I presume that this sort of the plurality of public opinion, um, which was expressed in the, in those newspapers like Mercurius Politicus, the Marchmont Needham's newspaper. Yeah, that's. That was reflected in the army itself, the New Model Army, wasn't it? Which, if I remember, is, was significantly more radical than its leaders, Cromwell and Fairfax, weren't they? They were very fired up by these changes. Yes, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's it, the plurality of views, as you say, you know, but newspapers, you know, um, as there are today with, you know, with opposing um, sort of political stances and religious stances on issues, and they, they, they fueled... Um, the development of that um, of, of those different uh, different positions among the readership and vice versa, 
Um, and I think, you know, you do, yeah, I mean, you see this extraordinary um, sort of development of kind of heterogeneous um, viewpoints about politics, absolutely, and, and the New Model Army, very influenced by the levellers. Um, you know, had a very strong sort of um, socially reforming streak through it, which exceeded what any of its high command was prepared to do. Not least because they were, you know, sort of gentry, you know, traditional um, people with traditional gentry background, Cromwell himself included, who were, <clears throat> you know, might be prepared to chop the king's head off, but they certainly weren't going to give, you know, enfranchise the poor or anything, you know, anything as radical as that. Um, but also religion. I mean, you know, this is one of the really fascinating things about this decade is that you know, I always think about it that you know, there's no doubt it was a constitutional failure of the Republic, but it was in so many ways a, um, you know, to, to be utterly formative in terms of what came next. And the idea that there might be religious difference between people and that might be an acceptable state of affairs within a nation, within a, within a society was really, you know, kind of completely novel. And although it was only to a degree during the 1650s that there was kind of toleration of religious difference, there was some and there never had been before. Um, so, yeah, that's a that's an amazing um, development, which, you know, it would take it would take a generation after the 1650s before that became enshrined legally in the Toleration Act in this country. But nonetheless, it was that you know, that germinated as a as a seed during this decade with great consequences. Mm. Let's talk about a couple of other of your characters as well, um, your exemplary characters who who provide such colour and s- sustenance in, in, in the book. Tell us about Anna Trapnell, um, who I feel very sorry for, I must say. Yes. So I really, as I was talking about, about uh, as I was just talking about, you know, because it, because one of the big phenomena of this decade is about um, about this sort of the, the, the plurality of religious outlook that is permitted and which is kind of burdens like mad when the when the sort of heavy hand of the established church is lifted um i really wanted to to have a a person who would be one of my i think i've got nine my people my protagonists i really wanted to have somebody who would chart a course through that um but i really really wanted to try to find a woman because one of the Mm. things that's very interesting about this decade as a whole which is that um, the, the, the experience of women changed a great deal, partly because war is always a changer of kind of female experience in, in, in um, traditional societies, because the men are away, and so immediately that changes everything. But also because the particular kind of um, what we would now call non-conformist religious outlook, so people who who who, who experienced religion through a very sort of non-hierarchical set of kind of church structures. The opposite end of the scale from the Catholic Church, very very hierarchical, very unhierarchical. So Baptists, Quakers, and others, was that it really changed women's position because instead of their communication with God, which is what everyone cared about, being via a priest or um, a kind of interceding man, it was a direct. You know, everyone had a direct relationship with God. That was the nature of these churches. So it, it meant that women had kind of valid religious experiences, um, on in a way that it really wasn't the case to anything like the same degree before. And so Anna Trapnell is a fascinating character because she had religious visions and there was huge excitement about her religious visions. God appeared to her um, and told her what he wanted and what was going to happen and gave her these kind of, you know, um, sometimes clear, sometimes deeply weird um, apparitions, if you like, which people, which she then told people about and they, they wanted to learn about. So, and she has a very interesting story in herself because she she was sort of adopted as a kind of political mascot and then she kind of throws that off herself. Um, so I was very interested in what it was like if you were her um, and, and how that, um, how somebody in that position, what their experience would be. But also I was really interested in her because she's often with history, you have good records and I, all of this is you know written from primary material you have good records for people of a certain kind of social background because that they tend to be literate and archives survive and so on which means that you never get a glance at a whole universe of people below a sort of so certain sort of level of, of um sort of seniority or you know within the social hierarchy but anna trapnell was the daughter of a shipwright she wasn't she wasn't the bottom of the heap socially but she was you know she was um, in in the lower kind of ranks of society, she grew up in East London, and um, she lived, you know, in the in the in the streets of you know around um, Deptford and the dockyards. So I was really interested to understand what the world looked like from her 
point of view and how th- it was both a time of great liberation because she was you know this wasn't being she wasn't being kind of locked up for, for she was what's called a fifth monarchist which is a kind of one of these um, non-conformist sects of the 1650s but at the same time she was became a kind of political she was adopted as a sort of as a sort of political mascot and she she fought her way out of that with great dignity and um, poise and I, I just thought it was fascinating to, 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 to understand what her life would be like. And I think so often with particularly people in this period, we think of so often kind of her caricature of sort of sort of sour faced Puritans, you know, cancelling Christmas. And, you know, they, they, that people from that sort of um, side of things are, are seen as being desperately unsympathetic killjoys and so on. And just, you know, they're all human beings. So there's got to be more to it than that. And of course, there is. And when you start understanding what Anna Trapnell's life was like, how she was brought up, what she was striving for, um, what the circumstances were that she had to operate in as a young, independent woman with no children, um, you it becomes real and you have sympathy and understanding of why she acted as she did and those around her did. And I just find that very, very helpful. Absolutely. And it's very, very effective. And, and, and of course, hovering over everyone and everything is Oliver Cromwell, who you also... <laughs> restore to a sort of personhood, if you like. Um, he, extraordinary odd character, and I think a very sort of sympathetic and balanced account. Tell us a bit about the Cromwell of your book as opposed to the Cromwell of sort of mythology. That's the, what's the gap between the two? Well, so I, I really wanted this whole book not to be about war. And I remember when we were doing the cover, I said, don't want to have any kind of sort <laughs> of weapons and cannons and you know it's not it's not a book about the civil war the civil war is over it's a book about what happened after the civil war at least most of it's over and oliver cromwell you know so often thought about as a you know as a, a round head you know the soldier of these great battles of the civil war and i wanted to you know which and he obviously that that all happened but i wanted to write about him as a as somebody who after the fighting has ended has you know has got to move from being as it were a campaigner to being somebody who's actually trying to to um, hold a nation together and you know be to rule as he ends up doing after um, the creation of the protectorate and to so to try and get away from seeing him just through a lens of kind of you know artillery fire and all that kind of stuff and to see him as a human being and at um, uh, trying to to to, to reconcile um the the kind of conflicting kind of aspirations of people around him that thing about you know careful what you wish for i mean the victory that is is, is won in the civil war then turns into a, a a new state that 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 they have to try to keep stable and that's really challenging um but also he's such an interesting figure because essentially he's a product he's a you know he's he's not a He's not somebody who comes from the underbelly of society. Quite the opposite. Came from a very smart family. Grew up in great sort of comfort and grandeur. His uncle was a knight, and you know he certainly, um, had, almost certainly, had met um, James I on a number of occasions, hunting on his uncle's estate. So he comes from a very kind of conventional, wealthy, affluent, sort of socially elevated background. But he has a personal breakdown. Very interesting in his middle years and loses all his money and he has a kind of religious epiphany out of it so what is born of that is a man in two halves he is both still the country gentleman but he is also the kind of you know the wide-eyed um sort of convert both religious and to other aspects of kind of reformism through his conversion and i was just really interested to know what that looked like and it's you know for me understanding a person in the round you know looking at his relationship with his family you'd think he'd be the most awful kind of fire and brimstone sort of a father you know sort of um lecturing and 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 invoking you know um uh sort of awful sort of devilish um possibilities for his family he's not at all like that you would his letters incredibly kind to his daughter saying you know don't don't worry about being too religious you know and wanting his son to have enough money to you know have lovely horses and so you just you know people are so much more interesting than any caricature um communicates and i don't mean that he didn't have very great shortcomings and there was absolutely no doubt that the treatment of people in Ireland on his campaigns was you know you know unspeakable but that's that there was more to him than that why was such violence meted out against the Irish in particular well it was born of a couple of things I mean at the heart of it was a, a point of view um uh which or a kind of um a belief which wasn't in any way 
particular to Cromwell, and it was widespread in England in the 17th century, which is that Irish people were just sort of sort of lesser. And it was partly because they're Catholics, and there was a great, you know, um, there was a great suspicion of, you know, Catholics as answerable to this, sort of, you know, the, to the Pope, who was a kind of, you know, an, a sort of antichrist. So there was a general widespread view that, you know, you could just basically treat people in Ireland completely differently than you would other people in English and Scots people, because they were just sort of, you know, to, you, 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 they somehow didn't merit the same level of kind of humanity as other people. And that was absolutely the, you know, I'm afraid the view, not, not on kind of individual basis, you know, if people had individual Irish friends, they, they were very nice to them, but the kind of absolute lack of compassion for the, for the plight of Ireland and Irish people was pretty widespread in England at the time. Plus, there was a very specific mm. formulation about how um, the fighting in Ireland was to be paid for, which predated Cromwell. It was Charles the First era formulation, which was that the lands of the defeated Irish would be used to pay for the um, for the funds that had backed the uh, the English army. So, so there was a kind of baked in requirement to, to dispossess the people of Ireland, which was horrific and um, had consequences that are still you know still with us today. And what what do we know about the attitudes of more ordinary folk, the length and breadth of the country, towards the execution of Charles the First? The book, I think, your book is brilliant at taking us out of the sort of metropolitan bubble to the far northeast of England and the southwest. And it's one of the things I thought was utterly fascinating about it. Oh, thank you. Um, so, what do people think? Well, you know, you get you get you get different glimpses of this. I mean, it's quite interesting when John Bradshaw, who we were talking about, who who oversaw the trial of Charles I after the trial, he became the um, the chairman of the Council of State, and one of his jobs in doing that was to um, interrogate various informers um, or get evidence from various informers about kind of plots against the regime. And one of the interesting things about those is you get actual verbatim reports of what people were saying to one another in pubs and so on because they're it's part of what's written down as, as, as evidence and those, those um, documents survive. And, you know, they give you a pretty um, vivid flavour of um, what was being said. This is in London in the months after the execution of Charles I. I mean, there's one conversation that's recorded between two men in, a, in a, um, an alehouse where one is saying that, um, you know, the people who, the, in fact, I was saying specifically of Bradshaw, you know, the man who oversaw that trial, you know, deserved to you know, be chopped up into small pieces and to be boiled and he'd feed him to his dogs if he got the chance and then said if his dogs wouldn't eat him he'd eat him himself so you know this is really visceral hatred and disgust for what's just happened and there definitely was quite a lot of that um and i you know there's no question that the execution of charles the first was not you know if you'd had a if you'd had a referendum if such a thing had even existed as a concept you know the <laughs> would have overwhelmingly voted against it. I mean, it didn't didn't enjoy popular support. But at the same time, I think there were lots of people who just had more important things to worry about. And so um, mm. although they might not have supported it, or, or as it were, if asked, said that they thought it was a good idea, at the same time, they weren't prepared to put their life livelihood or anything on the line to prevent it or to rise up against it. So lots of people, even those who had um, been active supporters of Charles I, of the... Of the um, government forces during the civil war you know there's a kind of was a kind of oath of loyalty you were required to sign um after the execution you know signed up to it and just decided to kind of you know to live with it um and i think you know you can again that's another thing and i just really wanted to try and get this across in the book is that even in this time of tremendous political and social religious change there are a huge number of people who um aren't involved at all and and as I say, have just got have just got more important things to get on with. You know, the most people didn't take either side in the civil war uh, because they just, you know, they, it, the, the, what the nature of the kind of political settlement was in London felt like a long way from the you know top of their list of things to 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 put their livelihoods on the on the line for. So um, mm. although it didn't, I don't think that the, there was there was very little kind of very excited popular support for it outside some specific pockets like the army. Um, but at the same time, there was an awful lot of people who thought, well, I guess that's how it is. Um, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining us, Anna. Um, and very best of luck in the final stages of the competition.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, this podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation, and we're grateful, as always, to them. Do join me again when I'll be speaking to another shortlisted author for the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction 2022. The shortlist this year, to remind you, is Legacy of Violence by Caroline Elkins, The Escape Artist by Jonathan Friedland, My Fourth Time We Drowned by Sally Hayden, A Fortunate Woman by Polly Morland, Super Infinite by Catherine Rundell, and The Restless Republic by Anna Kay, the book that we've been discussing today. Thank you again. See you again. Bye-bye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.